So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Devinder Barwa, uh, DM in Criminology and Rheumatology from Jipmer. I worked previously as senior resident in the Department of Rheumatology in AIMS. I did my MD medicine from AIMS and I did my MBS from AIMS in Delhi. Uh, today, the topic for today's class is Pages Disease of Bone and Other Disorders. We will complete this uh, topic uh, under two sections, uh, two parts. Today, we will discuss the part part one and the second part will be discussing probably on Wednesday as this is a, a big topic. And uh, this uh, presentation is uh, based on whatever is given Harrison and wherever there were some lacunas, some extra thing was required. We have taken data from either uh, general articles or we have taken data from the standard book of rheumatology that is Hodgeberg and Kelly. So uh, this uh, presentation will be uh, We'll be discussing following headings. Uh, we will see first case scenarios, then we will see about pages disease, then disorders of bone density. Then we will end this uh, today. That will be end of part one. And the next class that probably will be will be uh, uh, will be held on Wednesday evening. We will discuss about disorders of bone mineralization, fibro dysplasia, uh, hypertrophic osteoarthropathy soft tissue calcification ossification. Uh, this uh, uh, achondroplasia, hypochondroplasia, we have not covered in this uh, presentation, although this is given in Harrison in this uh, same thing. So that we will be covering in the next section. Okay. So let's see case scenario. So this is your OPD. You finish your MD medicine or maybe your DM in your course, and then this is your busy OPD. And you have several patients waiting in your uh, OPD waiting room. And let's say they were bored and they decided to play carom board. And now four different patients, they want to play carom board together. And let's see what these, uh, what those patients are. So one guy is 68 year old male and he has come for a headache and there's a prominent temporal artery on one side. With these complaints, he's come to your OPD. One other guy who is playing carom, uh, another person is six year old female child. She has presented to you with a left thigh pain for a few months. She also has uh, many uh, blackish brownish skin, small lesions over her body. Then one other guy is there who's like 28 year old male who has presented with the, both wrist and ankle pain uh, for several months. And also there is uh, there are prominent, uh, prominent uh, uh, skin just a minute. Prominent skin markings. And the fourth guy is a 10 year old male child presented with deformed left tibia that is painful. And also there's pain in the left knee for several months. These four people, they are, they are they decided to play carom as they're waiting in your OPD. And there's one fifth person who is just watching this match. Okay. This is the first guy, a 68 year old male known diabetic for 10 years, but taking his medication uh, properly, mostly uh, euglycemic control, complaint of low grade fever, deep dull headache for last six months. On examination, you were able to see a prominent temporal artery on the right side. And uh, one of the reports that he has brought, he's showing ESR of 78 mm per hour, uh, first hour. And then we are thinking about proper diagnosis. So old age person, with the high ESR, with the headaches, probably we'll have a guess in our mind, but we don't know what is the diagnosis. Okay. And then second, uh, this is that 10 year old male child who presented with deformed left tibia, which is painful. And there's also left knee pain for us four months. Uh, uh, this is uh, left tibia X-ray. Mixed lytic and sclerotic lesions are there and we can see uh, this is the appearance. This is the X-ray which he has come with, and there are we can see there is thickening of this uh, cortic cortex of the bone. There are cracks in that uh, outer cortex, and one of the reports, blood report, is showing ALP value of twenty six hundred units per liter. That is actually very high, and we don't know what is the proper diagnosis. Then we have this six year old female child who presented with left thigh pain. Actually, when you examine the patient, you realize that this female child has got uh, uh, early puberty attainment, uh, precocious puberty, 
Then these are the hyperpigmented macular spots. As you can see, there are multiple of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we could see now. And this is on the x-rays, left, left hip joint. And we can see, see there is some deforming pathology of fever. Okay. So we have to think about the diagnosis. The fifth guy, uh, the fourth guy is 28 year old male who present with complete complaint of bilateral wrist and ankle pain. And he has got prominent skin marking on face and scalp. He was thinking, I don't know what is happening wrong with me. So he shaved his head and then he realized there are prominent uh, uh, skin folds on his, on his scalp also. And uh, you could see there is clubbing and there is some widening of the wrist, some pain is there. So in this case also, we have to think about probable diagnosis. And the fifth guy, 18 years old male, relatively asymptomatic, he came with this hand x-ray only. And somehow he, somehow he thinks that he might be kind of mutant. He might be some or something. He has doubt in his mind and he has come to clear that off. So these are the five case scenarios that are there, we will be able to solve all these five case scenarios after both the classes uh, will be done. Okay. So with this, we'll go to pages disease. Uh, remember these case scenarios, you might find one of them in, in, in this disease, maybe more, uh, more than one. Uh, so pages disease is actually a localized bone remodeling disorder. And it is associated with overactive osteoclastic bone resorption that is actually followed by a compensatory increase in osteoclastic new bone formation. So there is increased osteoclast activity and to compensate that osteoclast activity, there is increased osteoclastic activity. This, that means there is increased bone resorption that is actually being followed by increased bone formation. Okay. Uh, pagetic bone, whenever wherever it is involving the body will be an expanded kind of bone, less compact and more vascular. Now remember, whenever Page's disease is happening, the bone that is involved, overall the mass actually increases. But because that uh, volume of the bone will also increase and the quality of bone that is being formed is also not good, overall the quality of bone is, is suffering. Then that is why it is more prone to deformities and fractures. So Page's disease was first uh, described by Sir James Page in 1876. He was thinking it is some kind of chronic inflammation of bone. That's why at that time he gave term osteitis deformance. And this one paper uh, has uh, seen that uh, uh, they found lots of mummies in UK and those were from 900 to 1500 AD and many of the skeleton were showing features of Pages disease. Uh, epidemiology, generally these uh, Pages disease cases are not in pediatric age group, generally seen more than 40 years of age and prevalence increases with age. So mostly you will not find any uh, Rarely you'll find any uh, young person with pages. Mostly they'll be old people. Prevalence is roughly 3% in more than 40 years of age in those countries where it is prevalent, not in all populations. And family history can be seen up to 40% of people. Uh, this pages disease commonly seen with European ancestry, although specific genes are not known. But uh, wherever people are, wherever countries people are living from European ancestry, there will be uh, the high rate of prevalence of uh, this disease. Uh, male female ratio is roughly 1 is to 1. And nowadays, what is happening with time, uh, there is decrease in prevalence and severity. Earlier, uh, like 50 to 60 years earlier, there were uh, cases were severe, uh, polyostatic cases, and uh, prevalence was high, but now it is decreasing. So, this table is showing countries where it is most prevalent and countries where it is least prevalent. In our country, India, it is least prevalent. And uh, countries like UK, USA, France, Spain, Italy, wherever there is European ancestry, prevalence rate is high. Okay. So positive family history is found in up to 25% uh, of uh, patients. And to understand what is the basic etiology, let's see this figure from Harrison. So in this figure, understand this, this is the surface of the bone. And this is a osteoclast because it has multiple nuclei. And you can see osteoblast. As we discussed already in one of the, our discussions earlier, that osteoclast and osteoblast will work together in bone remodeling. So what happens? This osteoclast has to resolve the bone. Osteoblast has to lay down the bone matrix. And this happens with the help of the language of multiple molecules. 
in those osteoprotectin rank ligin and rank are important so what happens this osteoclast has got rank that is actually receptor for rank ligin so once this rank ligand is bound to rank the signal transduction is is occurring in osteoclast osteoclast become activated then it will form this uh, bmu unit then there will be acidification and bone will be dissolved this rank ligand binding with rank is increase in many condition like presence of il1 and il6 this rank ligand rank will increase this is how inflammation increases the bone resorption then if you see this osteoprotectin it is the natural antagonist of uh, this rank ligand if there is high osteoprotectin osteoprotectin can bind with this rank receptor in place of rank ligand that's how osteoprotectin can decrease this reaction and decreases the activity of osteoclast okay then these are igf1 igf2 these factors are important for the osteoblastic activity mesenchymal cells they produce this uh, mcs effector which actually help in recruiting and uh, activation of osteoclast precursor they finally will form the osteoclast so this this we know that this that is happening and there is let down of collagen and osteocalcin all these molecules being let down with the help of osteoclast so if we see suppose if there is increased activity of rank ligand or there is decreased activity of osteoprotectin then we can understand that there will be more activity of osteoclast and we know in case of pages disease this is the basic defect so let's see some genetic defects which are associated with pages disease so this gene tnfr sf11 a and 11 b this 11 b is actually coding for osteoprotectin and this is actually coding for rank suppose if there is activation of activation mutation of this rank obviously there will be most osteoclast activity so this activating mutation of rank can lead to familial expansile osteolysis uh, expansile skeletal hyperphosphatasia early onset pages disease okay if there is deficiency of osteoprotectin that can lead to juvenile pages disease familial idiopathic hyperphosphatasia but remember most of the cases will be sporadic as we have seen already positive family history we see only 20% patient so these defects are generally uncommon but we understood here that if there is by any mean by any means more rank ligand rank interaction more osteoclast activity then probably patient will have pages disease okay so let's move forward to pathogenesis so one third cases can have autosomal dominant inheritance because of defect in various genes and most common mutation that is seen is actually this sequestrom 1 ubiquitin associated uh, protein domain of uh, protein p62 and uh, familial cases uh, can be seen up to 40% of uh, patients sporadic uh, this uh, mutation can be seen in 45% uh, uh, familial cases and up to 10% of sporadic cases so this mutation is common in both familial cases as well as sporadic cases uh, this figure is from hoshberg and this figure depicts that pages disease of bone will develop when there will be some genetic component there will be some environmental factors and there will be interaction between these two so there can be in genetics there can be autosomal dominant inheritance because of many genes or there can be most common sequestrom one gene mutation though and uh, then in normal factor there are toxins like arsenic lead tobacco all these are implicated but not proven and uh, then uh, rural agency so this interaction can occur and also some viruses are also uh, been implicated like paramiso virus measles canine distemper virus and there are some jivas which are associated with disease so all these interact and then there can be uh, onset of pages disease of bone so this figure is showing why sequestrosome mutation is leading to your pages disease now this is what is actually happening inside the osteoclast once rank ligand is bound to rank so what happens once rank ligand is bound to rank then this activation of this protein trap 6 it bind, binds to p62 cyclin d and this opitin protein so what happens after this rank ligand rank uh, uh, when rank ligand bind to rank then there is activation of this pathway and there will be activation of this uh, uh, map ke pathway and uh, nf cap kappa b pathway it will lead to uh, activation of multiple these molecules and then ultimately ap1 nf kappa b and they will go to nucleus and they will be 
uh, activation of osteoclast response genes and that's how action will be done. So what happens generally, here is this, this cystrome one gene that protein is there. So what happens, this actually cuts it. It cuts it so, so that what happens that activity, rank ligand and rank activity is controlled by this cystrome G. So one, suppose, Normally, what is happening? This, this here, this P62 part. This is the part of cystrum gene. So, what happens? Normally, rank ligand binds with rank. Then, trap six is activated. This P62 binds with this protein and cyclin D. And after activation, this will cut it. Cut it. Then, what will happen? It will not be further activated and signal be inhibited. In case of this mutation of cystrosome, this P62 cannot bind cyclin D, and then cyclin D will not be able to cut it. What I want to say that because of sequestrosome mutation, there is uncontrolled activation of rank ligand rank axis. That's how it leads to more activity of osteoclast. This is pathogenesis related to sequestrosome mutation. Okay. So, but there are other things which are implicated in pathology like impaired autophagy. This is a new concept in the pathogenesis of uh, uh, Pages disease. When we were UGs, it was not there. Now it is there. So what they're telling, that in your this uh, patients of uh, uh, Pages disease, they have seen that there is uh, uh, defect in development of defect in autophagy pathways. So what happens in autophagy generally, whenever there is uh, some stress to cell, like hypoxia is there, nutrient deprivation is there. So there is activation of various uh, proteins and ultimately this formation of autophagosome. Autophagosome will bind to lysosome and then formation of autolysosome. And that's how these uh, stored proteins or let's say fat, fat or some other macromolecules will be consumed. So what they have seen in these patients of osteoclast, they have seen there is a collection of these autophagosome in, in retention of these autophagosome in osteoclast cells and autophagy is actually impaired. So this is one of the pathways how Paget disease can be, uh, uh, can be there. Apart from that, uh, there is something known as uh, IBM PFD that is actually stands for inclusion body myopathy, Pages disease, and frontal nebular dementia. So in these three disease, these three diseases can be uh, found together or they can be found uh, separately. What they have seen, they have seen that there is mutation in the velocin containing protein, VCP gene. So this VCP gene, if you see, this VCP gene is actually one of the part of then they are forming this uh, uh, autophagosome, then the VPC gene is required. So what happens because of defect in that uh, uh, VCP gene, velocity containing protein, there can be also uh, impaired autophagy and there can be disruption of the ubiquitin proteasome disease pathway. So these are multiple ways through which there can be onset of Pages disease in the patient. Okay, so this was genetic. Now see normal factors. Many factors have been implicated. None is proven, but yet still you need to know them. Exposure to paramyxovirus, canine distemper virus and measles, it has been seen that uh, these uh, our uh, pediatric uh, patients will have more amount of antibody against nuclear capsule of measles. And uh, measles virus nuclear capsule can promote a pediatric phenotype in osteoclasts and mouse models. Uh, what happens when this uh, infection occurs, this measles virus nuclear capsule is there, there is induction of IL-6. And uh, we have seen earlier that IL-6, excess IL-6 actually can lead to excess osteoclast activation. And uh, this measles virus nuclear capsid when is is injected in the, into the mouse models, we have seen that there is increased IL-6 expression. Uh, apart from that, what is the effect of that thing? So uh, all being said, now see this, this is a normal figure actually. So what happens, this is, this is a normal bone surface that is, uh, if you see, this is osteoclast. It is forming a resorption pit here. And generally, osteoclast will be activated and it will resolve this uh, uh, bone at a particular rate in a particular fashion. You can see multiple nuclei. So osteoclasts are generally giant cells with multiple nuclei. So what happens in Pages disease and in normal? Normally, osteoclasts are big, but compared to pagetic, they are small. Pagetic osteoclasts are very large in size. Nuclei will be in normal osteoclasts somewhere to five cells, five per cells. In pagetic osteoclasts, there will be 90 to 100 nuclei per cell. And normal rate of bone resorption is one microgram per day. And in pagetic osteoclasts, it can be eight, uh, eight times more, like eight microgram per day. Now, remember this. In the last classes, we discussed that when bone is, bone is resolved, then bone is formed. Realize this, if the rate of bone resorption is high, very high, 
then osteoblast has to produce blast have to produce bone at high rate when they produce bone at high rate they have to produce more bone in less time in less time they cannot provide a quality work it means whatever bone is laid down is actually a low quality bone woven bone and that is why it is more prone to fracture so although osteoblasts are trying to compensate with osteoclast but whatever they are forming it is not up to the mark because the rate of uh, formation is very high okay so uh, and apart from that apart from this thing these osteoclasts have been found to be more uh, sensitive to vitamin d now realize this remember this that vitamin d actually directly can work on osteoclast through its receptor and it actually increases the activity of osteoclast normally also in pediatric disease this uh, sensitivity will increase and also this osteoclasts are hyper hypersensitive to rank ligand increase rank like expression can be seen by marrow stromal cell because of various reasons increase il6 levels as already we discussed and there can be increased expression of cfos increase osteoclast activity because this cfos was one of the pathways as we have seen in previous slides so this also can be increased because of various reasons and there is increased expression of anti apoptotic oncogene bcl2 so that their life span is also increased so overall if we see all these things are leading to increase activity of osteoclast if we go for histopathology let's see types of bone woven bone primary bone and secondary bone now realize uh, that all these three will be seen uh, normally also but in, but in case of pediatric uh, uh, disease uh, there will be more more of woven bone and primary bone than secondary bone so in woven bone there is randomly oriented small diameter collagen fibers they will be porous and with high mineralized bone in uh, primary bone generally it has to be deposited into pre existing substrate and is organized into lamellar structure secondary bone is product of resorption of pre existing bone and replacement with new bone so bone formation is not a simple process bone formation will uh, be in multiple steps first they will uh, will uh, there will be formation of woven bone like they'll put lots of lots of fibers and then later on what will happen this fiber will be oriented into parallel fashion and then they will filling up these pits in between with the calcium hydroxyapatite and everything then again cleaning this thing will happen and that's how the bone is formed that's why bone is so strong because it is very nicely oriented and arranged uh what happens in your pediatric disease so pediatric disease generally goes through three phases there is a lytic phase there is a mixed phase there is sclerotic phase or burnt out phase so what happens in lytic phase lytic phase basically is the first phase in which there is more activity of osteoclast so there will be a prominent bone resorption there will be marked hypervascularization there will be an advancing lytic wedge or blade of grass lesion in mixed phase there will be appearance of lytic as well as uh, uh, areas of bone formation and whatever bone will be formed it will be haphazard bone there will be no any uh, uh, parallel orientation of fibers and there can be also some replacement of this normal uh, bone tissue with fibrous connective tissue and in sclerotic phase there will be uh, uh, decline in the bone resorption and then subsequently there will be a hard dense and less vascular pegetic or mosaic bone formation so this figure is from uh, one of the rheumatology textbook if you see that somewhere there is lamellar structure now this area there is no lamellar structure this area no lamellar structure then this area lamellar structure is there this is lamellar structure so what pattern we are seeing it's kind of mosaic pattern so there is area of normal bone formation area of weak bone bone formation so this kind of pathology is seen in case of pediatric disease of bone uh so uh, despite increase activity of osteoclast and osteoblast whatever uh, dirt is there it is there in the bone only there is no spillage of calcium and phosphate in blood so what i want to tell you from this that it is quite possible that in the patient of pediatric disease there is so much rapid increase in bone formation and this and that but patient serum calcium and phosphate level may be normal so patient will generally present with normal calcium and phosphate unless there is deficiency of calcium unless there is deficiency of vitamin d so uh, other secondary changes which can be seen in histopathology of pediatric disease is increased vascularity there can be peritrabricular fibrosis and there can be loss of normal marrow elements over time so these findings can be additional uh, in addition to 
your mosaic pattern of bow. Coming to clinical features, so how do these patients present? Most common presentation is, presentation is asymptomatic. So generally, one patient will come to you, you will see one ALP report showing some 3000 or 5000 ALP value or some extra will be done for something else and then you realize in extra some, some bone thickening is there, some abnormal bone is there. Like that kind of presentation is practically most common. And uh, uh, there can be bone deformities, like there can be disfigurement, there can be pain and fracture, or there can be nerve compression because of uh, increased thickness of the bones, generally happen in case of head and neck area. Uh, either there can be a monoosteotic disease or there can be a polyosteotic disease. Monoosteotic disease is common nowadays. Earlier, polyosteotic disease was, was more frequently seen, but overall, monoosteotic disease is most common. These are the sites and manifestation with which they commonly present. If there is skull involvement, there can be hearing loss, there can be headache, visual disturbance. All these are because this is because of uh, compression of uh, uh, nerves or skull may settle and soften in tamoshanta shape that can result in basal imagination called compression and hydrocephalus. This tamoshanta is nothing but such kind of cap. Uh, this kind of cap is there. This is known as tamoshanta cap. And uh, when there is a uh, basal imagination because of softening of the base of uh, this uh, skull, then what can happen? Then there can be this elevation like this, looking like tamoshanta. So this, this is known as uh, Temoshanta uh, deformity. Then a uh, lumbosical spine, if involved, then there can be spinal cord lesions, isolated radiculopathy can be there, there can be spinal stenosis, or there can be cord syndrome because of compression. Pelvis can be involved, femur, when involved, there's bowing deformity, there can be felty, fracture, falls. And generally, the beauty of disease is that generally bone is involved uh, in isolated manner. But it can be seen that there will be some degenerative osteoarthritic changes in the nearby joint. That can happen. Okay, other features like apart from this uh, musculoskeletal feature, there can be sometimes they can present with tumors. Most common tumor, not most common tumor, but most commonly described tumor is osteosarcoma, and there is benign GCT. So these osteosarcoma benign GCT can be there when they are there. We have to look for them. And apart from that, uh, there can be cardiovascular findings like high output cardiac failure can be there. This is commonly taught as one of the causes of, uh, like when we used to read in our time in coaching, they will tell causes of high output cardiac failure, one of the causes was Page's disease. But in reality, it doesn't happen like that. Unless there is already some coexisting or uh, pre-existing cardiac condition is there, generally it will not happen. High output cardiac failure is more common with, with people who have more involvement, obviously more involvement than there is more uh, cardiac output. So generally, these patients will be having ALP more than four times the normal limit. Skeletal involvement will be more, some 15 to 30 percent. In such case, patients, there can be some cardiovascular involvement. Apart from that, there can be calcific aortic stenosis or there can be seen diffuse vascular calcification. But overall, these uh, uh, features are not common. Coming to imaging, imaging of these patients, what, what findings are there? So we do radiograph. We do radiograph. Uh, for uh, anatomy of lesions and we do bone scan to look for extent of disease. So why do we want to look for bone extent of disease? Because we need to follow these patients up. We want to see whether treatment is working or not, whether there is any failure of therapy. Uh, so radiograph and bone scan are the most, uh, um, are the most common uh, imaging modalities that are being used in patients' diseases of bone. So let's see what are the findings. So in this, this is I think uh, fibula, this is trivia. This is, you can see foot, uh, foot bones. So there will be thickened cortical bones. There will be missed latex sclerotic lesions. They will evolve over time with subsequent distortion and overgrowth affected bone. And lesions usually begin in subchondral area, like here they will begin, and they will, will, will progress contiguously beneath the cortex. So if you see, in compared to normal bone, this bone has actually got a thickened, thickened cortex. See, this thickness is increased. This thickness is increased. And area is mixed. Somewhere you can see lytic area, this lytic area, lytic area, this is sclerotic area. Okay, this is sclerotic area, right? So there will be mixing of sclerotic and lytic area. There will be contiguous lesions. There will be deformity of bone. And although in this case, it is not quite visible, but generally there can be a degenerative arthropathy of the nearby joint. 
there can be other findings there can be some fracture lines you will see in the subsequent slides uh there can be a cortical tunneling and trabecular thickening may present so what what can happen this generally trabecular will not be appreciated in normal people in case of now, now see this line this line is going like this now see this line so this line is a part of trabecular which is which has become visible because of increased thickness in case of pages disease uh then it, uh, in case of vertebra there are multiple changes one of the things is they can be slipping of vertebra if you see this vertebra this vertebra has actually slipped behind backward and it can also lead to compression of neural components now see uh, this figure is showing uh, femur and two different figures are there so generally this is how pelvic femur will, will be appearing there will be thickened cortex there will be increased thickness of these uh, trabecular bone then there will be uh, uh, area of mixed sclerotic and lytic pattern now this thing is actually showing a kind of fracture because bone quality is very much compromised when bone breaks it can break through and through and these are known as chalk stick fracture and because of weight bearing femur is actually taking the load of the body there can be a pair of small fissures like you can see these 1 2 3 4 these are small fissures they appeared uh, in cortical bone and generally these changes will be appearing on the uh, convex lateral portion of the of the femur and uh, disease of bone does not cause normal articular surface although it may bridge bony calluses so what what does that mean that means your joint can have some degenerative changes and generally the other bone this side of bone like suppose if knee is in knee tibia is involved then mostly femur will not be involved. generally generally that kind of thing will happen and now one of the dd of this kind this kind of transverse fracture line is pseudo fractures and pseudo fracture as we discussed last time we seen in case of vitamin d deficiency but realize this pseudo fracture will be seen on concave side of bone while in case of pages disease generally these fracture lines will appear on the uh, convex side outer side okay and this you can see chalk stick fracture because of the poor quality of bone through and through bone fracture is there okay so now see tibia is involved in this case pejitive tibia and if you see there is degenerative changes the loss of joint space spiking of this tibial spine, spine is uh, is appreciated there is some osteophyte like changes are there and sclerosis is there so this this these are secondary uh, degenerative changes in the nearby joint when bone is it and otherwise if you see generally in case of uh, even in polyosteotic disease disease is focal only multiple foci can be there in case of monoosteotic disease there will be only one focus of disease and disease will be confined to there only okay now see changes in the skull so there are two kinds of skull changes you can see one is osteoporosis circumscriptiva and other is cotton wool skull so in case of cotton wool skull you can you can see there are areas of uh, some sclerotic areas some lytic areas some sclerotic areas and lytic areas so it will appear like cotton wool skull and uh, what now see in this in this thing you see this frontal part it is so much involved so you see this is showing uh, this very well nice uh, circumscribed sclerotic uh, skull with associated little like changes in the whole of the center of the skull so this is known as osteoporosis in the center circumscriptiva and this is known as cotton wool skull these both skull changes are uh, associated with your uh, pages disease coming to your pelvis in pelvis what you can see now see we were talking about that uh, focal nature so in this pelvis this is involvement of the right side only ischium and uh, this uh, uh, ischium and ilium bones are bones are involved so what happens generally there will be thickening of iliopectineal and iliosteal lines uh, as we can see in this uh, right side of pelvis there will be coarse trabeculation thickening of cortex all this will be there this this thickening is actually known as brin sign okay coming to uh, your other vertebral changes so now see in this picture what is happening there is a coarse thickening of this cortex of uh, your vertebra and uh, because of this thing what will appear it will appear like a uh, your uh, uh, picture frame so this is this is picture frame vertebra the so picture vertebra frame vertebra is because there is a vertebral cortical thickening of the superior and inferior end plates okay then these are two different kind of presentation it is ct image and you can see there is a mixed lytic and sclerotic lesion these are sclerotic part these are lytic part 
and if you see this uh, particular uh, vertebra this is like completely white completely sclerosed completely uh, like thick and bone type so this is known as ivory vertebra uh, there will be a diffuse radio dense enlargement ivory vertebra is not uh, none of these features are like pathognomonic of this disease ivory vertebra generally seen in case of either pages disease or in case of diseases malignancies which can have osteoblastic mets like uh, your prostate or like uh, few cases of breast cancer cancers in those uh, also you can see uh, your ivory vertebra coming to bone scan as we already discussed bone scan uh, helps determine extent of disease how many uh, bones are there and uh, we can use serial radiographs and bone scan to document progression of the disease if you see in this in this patient there is involvement of this part this part this part and this part and this part we can see that thing this is the same figure anteriorly and posteriorly that's why this is here what is visible is here so we can see this 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 uh, involvement of the spine and this is then uh, this is your involvement of your uh, pelvis maybe shoulder joint okay uh, coming to other modalities so generally radiographs are sufficient with bone scan for these patients of uh, pages disease uh, other modality we can use we can use ct especially you should use ct when there is suspicion of fracture uh, mri is indicated in patients where we are suspecting malignancy so generally these osteosarcoma and other thing they can actually invade surrounding tissue and once there is uh, suspicion of that there is there is malignancy or there is any suspicion of involvement of the contiguous tissue it's better to go with the mri in case of suspected malignancy it is always good to do a biopsy to rule out the malignancy type and for the planning coming to lab findings so what happens already we discussed because there is so much bone formation along with this bone resorption and alp that is alkaline phosphatase is one of the markers of your bone formation so generally your patient will have high levels of uh, uh, serum alp uh, we can also use your uh, p1 np that is and uh, and uh, terminal uh, procolytic procoly molecules but we should not use osteocalcin because osteocalcin p1 np alp all three are bone formation markers but osteocalcin is not high in all the cases that is why it should not be used anyhow it is not available so we are using alp only then there will be normal calcium and phosphate levels uh, unless there is deficiency of uh, calcium and phosphate because of nutritional reasons or vitamin deficiency now normal alp levels can be seen nowadays more commonly because there is decrease in prevalence and severity suppose if there is like uh, patient have monocystic disease involvement of uh, uh, less involvement of the bone then there can be normal alp levels and if suppose patient is presented to you with end stage disease there is no more ongoing bone formation and all burnt out disease is there in these cases you can have normal alp levels okay so markers of bone turnover are high it means both markers of bone formation as well as marker of both resorption can be high in case of active age disease uh, differential diagnosis that you should consider in your patient first thing is osteoporosis because there can be your this uh, uh, osteoporotic changes can be there uh, that can be confused with the uh, thing then osteomalacia as there can be some pseudo fracture like thingy then there are cancers and cancers like vertebra there can be ivory vertebra or some lytic changes all these can be there so always look for those things also and osteosarcoma is actually a complication of this disease which has to be closely followed up what are the complication of the disease so this osteosarcoma is actually not very common incidence is only 0.3% in this population and mean age is 76 years and generally uh, they present with associated uh, increased pain or some fracture or some uh, soft tissue involvement of the surrounding tissue or there can be uh, other complications like there can be neurologic compression syndromes because of involvement of the spine there can be disfigurement of or periodontal uh, complication as a result of periodontal bone affecting the mandible or maxilla there can be vascular steel syndrome but that will generally happen in the patient who will be having pre existing cardiac disease high output cardiac failure can be there there can be headache because of either compression of uh, 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 substances there can be or there can be uh, non specific pain there can be hearing loss now see this patient this we were, we were suspecting that time uh, we we discussed this in the beginning only so if you see in this patient 
this patient is showing your this presence of prominent temporal artery because simply because mostly there will be going ongoing uh, high bone turnover to provide more blood there is prominent temporal artery if i am given a patient with prominent temporal artery old age with headache with increased sir my first uh, 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 click will be uh, it it may be vasculitis but uh, in this patient if you see that patient has got some deformity on one side and maybe i'm thinking this patient may be having involuntary maxilla bypass disease so this is actually leon ts osea so leon means lion and uh, appearance when face appearance uh, become like uh, lion because of the, the, the bone involvement mm -hmm. this is known as leon ts osea so there will be other things uh, also like learning faces will be there in that also we go with this thing, this kind of thing but here leontis osea is basically because of bone involvement or bone deformities leontis osea can be seen pagetic maxilla there are other condition like agentism and uh, syphilis or tumor of the parent sinuses fibro dysplasia all these also can lead to leontis osea okay coming to treatment so what is the goal of treatment goals of treatment include we have to ease the pain because there can be pain because of uh, fracture or because of ongoing osteoclastic activity we have to prevent progression of the disease we have to improve the quality of the bone and we have to prevent further complications so our will therapies i will show you uh, therapies and i'll show you what what the problem with them so calcitonin can be used but it is short lived effect uh, short lived and the efficacy is less then etidronate one of the bisphosphonate actually toxicity can be there and there is a low turnover rate it can lead to osteomalacia pamidronate has intermediate response and zolindronate is agent of choice we will further see so this is table from your harrison and is showing pharmacological pharmacological agents approved for treatment of pages disease so remember drug of choice for uh, your pages disease is your zolindronic uh, acid apart from that pamidronate risedronate alendronate tilidronate etidronate and calcitonin is there calcitonin also can be given uh, if you see this they are showing normalization of alkaline phosphatase level now realize what can happen we all know when we give bisphosphonate there will be decrease bone resorption and that can lead to normalization of lp levels but that does not necessarily mean that therapy will be effective in preventing progression of disease okay so why i am saying so because now we'll see uh, this is one study it is a randomized trial of intensive bisphosphonate treatment versus symptomatic management in pages disease so far so if you see what they did in this study in this study they have provided bisphosphonate to one group uh, uh, intensive group and and one group they have given only symptomatic management so what they realized if you see participant with fracture total fracture fracture through pagetic bone clinical vertebral fracture and other complication whatever they are they are taking when they come when they have compared then what they have seen now see the effect size and with the confidence interval if you see the confidence interval for everything confidence interval is crossing one that actually means that that, that there is no difference in the intensive and symptomatic group now what harrison is saying about this study harrison is defending this study by by saying that in this study they have not used zolindronic acid they have used other alendronate and pamidronate but they have not used zolindronic acid probably this may be the reason why it was not that effective then uh, uh, this is the present trial and the same trial they have uh, seen this effect of treatment on bone pain and when they have seen this effect on bone pain like any bone pain and bone pain after 2 years and in the symptomatic group and intensive group p value was not different so as such if you see we don't have much robust data for the use of this thing but theoretically and our books are mentioning that zolindronic uh, acid will help preventing future complication and drug of choice as if now is your bisphosphonate that is zolindronic acid so this is one study which has actually compared single infusion of zolindronic acid with risedronate for pages disease in this study what they have seen they have seen that the gist of the study is that when they compared zolindronic acid with risedronate iv zolindronic acid infusion was much much better and uh, uh, when they have uh, uh, seen that lot of therapy response was was in one out of 10 patient up to uh, uh, they have seen the risk of relapse that is around 15% up to 10 years of follow up and the cumulative risk of death was more than 50% so message that you need to take from this slide is that when they compared head to head zolindronic is better 
and they have done a trial which although has not shown much benefit for uh, your uh, bisphosphonates but still this is the drug of choice uh, there is one case report of denosumab denosumab we have discussed in detail in our uh, previous classes you can see that so denosumab somebody has tried the case report is there they have uh, tried treating the disease and it, it has actually worked uh, apart from this treatment pharmacological treatment you need to care of other thing you can provide analgesics for pain bracing you can do gait training is required if there is deformity development walking aids can be provided surgery can be done corrective osteotomy can be done and uh, sometimes what can be there there can be hydrotomy bone formation in these patients and then we will take care of that part also after surgery follow up and treatment follow up generally is required at 6 months and then yearly so there is a definition for biochemical relief this is not mentioned in Harrison this is from the other books so total serum alp level that was both 50 percent above its last value and 1.25 times the upper limit the normal range this is known as biochemical relapse so generally how we follow you treat your patient with like suppose a patient comes to me i will treat him symptomatically for pain bracing walking it and everything and i will give a zoledonic acid infusion that i'll i'll give and then six monthly i'll call the patient for alp levels because if ALP is increased, I can take it as a biochemical relapse. Osteolytic lesions. Patient with osteolytic should be have a follow up radiograph after one year. Because what can happen, they can either have increase in this thing or they can develop uh, osteosarcoma, which can also uh, present like uh, new onset osteolytic lesions. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, as far as your uh, uh, Pages disease is concerned, it's uh, pathogenesis. Epidemiology, clinical features, treatment, follow-up, and uh, important radiological signs. And uh, after that, we will go to disorders of bone density. Today, I will just introduce your topic. Tomorrow, again, I will start from here only. But we will go a uh, few slides further so that we should we can maintain a continuity. Okay. So this this figure is very important. This figure is important because. If you see this figure nicely now, understand it now here only, maybe next three, four classes, it will help you out. This is simple classification of heritable connective tissue diseases. So how do we divide this heritable connective tissue disease? Either they can be disorders of hypermobility like Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos and other syndromes. So these disorders are actually given in the next chapter of your Harrison after the Pages disease. Or there can be disorders of bone density. Disorders of bone density can be divided into two parts. Either there can be increased bone density because of reduced activity of osteoclast, means reduced bone resorption. In these cases, you call them osteopetrosis. Or there can be some defect leading to more bone formation. Okay. So, Disorders of increased bone formation are known as osteosclerosis. So osteopetrosis and osteosclerosis. I remember it like S for synthesis. So new bone is being formed. That is osteosclerosis. And the other one is osteopetrosis. These both will lead to increased bone density. So they are the second class of uh, diseases. Then there are skeletal dysplasia. So skeletal dysplasia can be broadly divided into three kinds. There can be either osteochondrodysplasia, it means there will be a generalized bone along with or without cartilage element defect. These are known as osteochondrodysplasia. There can be dysostosis, it means there are, these are focal bone and bone endocartilage element defect. It means osteochondrodysplasia are generalized disorders and dysostosis are mostly focal disorders. And then we can have synostosis. Synostosis means uh, premature closure of cranial bone and sutures. So, this and this part we will be discussing when we'll discuss the next chapter and these bone density disorders we will be discussing in the uh, next discussion. Uh, before going, uh, before ending this session here only, I would like to use, I would like to show again these uh, two pathways of bone formation, although we have discussed it earlier in the class of fracture. So there is one wind, wind pathway, wind 4, when it acts on LRP5 and fissile protein, it leads to osteoblast proliferation and reduced length like. This pathway is actually inhibited by sclerostin or soluble fissile related protein or DKK1. 
So these three are inhibitors of this bone formation pathway. I also told last time that thyrostin is actually released from osteocytes, which are mechanosensitive uh, cells. And when there is less of load on the bone, there is more sclerostin. More sclerostin means less bone formation. This is how physical inactivity lead to risk of osteoporosis. Other pathway of bone formation is BMP pathway. BMP is actually bone morphogenic protein. BMP4 and 6, they are involved in bone formation. They will work on BMP receptor. TGA beta will be activated and osteoblast proliferation will be there. This pathway is inhibited by NOCI. So why I am telling you these pathways for a reason? Because when we will discuss about osteopetrosis, that is reduced bone absorption, or osteosclerosis, that is increased synthesis of bone, in those disorders, we will see mutation in these molecules. And these molecule mutation will lead to increased bone density disorders. Uh, Romosozumab, we have found this drug as antibody against the sclerostin. This was discussed in the fracture class. So this is end of part one. We will stop here only. If any questions are there, it, these are welcome. Then we will again start this discussion in the next class, probably maybe Wednesday uh, if possible. Thank you.